Here's Jeremy Demick. All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Thank you uh, to Bob and Brian at Motor Cities for having me. I'm uh, excited to talk to everybody this morning. Um, so yeah, uh, my name is Jeremy Dimmick. I'm manager of collect, sorry, director of collections at uh, the Detroit Historical Society. Uh, essentially, what I do there is I take care of all of our stuff. Um, so that includes the 250,000 objects that uh, Bob mentioned in my introduction there. Um, and uh, within those 250,000 objects are 90, uh, sorry, <laughs> I misspoke already, are 70 cars. Um, out of those 70 cars, we have about 50 on site at any given time, um, the, with the remaining balance being out on loan uh, to other institutions um, and uh, spread out kind of all over the country uh, and, and the world occasionally. Um, it's a pretty complete collection. It's um, fairly heavy in the early 20th century, kind of reflecting the, uh, the boom time that Detroit was making cars and it's kind of tapered off uh, as we get closer to the present, but we are still collecting um, and are evaluating vehicles uh, on a pretty regular basis when people offer them for donation. So we're still accepting objects and are still uh, interested in, in new cars that are being built in the city today. Um, out of those 70 cars, uh, they kind of fall into a handful of buckets. So we have uh, prototype cars, which I'm going to focus a, a good amount of this time we have today on. Uh, we have some interesting um, cars that belong to some famous Detroiters and famous auto people. We call them the auto barons, autos. Um, and then we have uh, just a set of cars that were driven by everyday people that were kind of representative of what was on the road at any given time. And I think that's actually my favorite part of the collection. You know, you go to a lot of different collections and see a lot of exotic stuff, concept cars or one-offs or, or cars that belong to famous people or auto executives, influential auto executives. Um, but that kind of leaves the, uh, the Dodge Caravans and Ford Tauruses yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but uh, are you going to be sharing uh, your slides at this I, point? I or? will. I, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the reminder here. I'll pull that up right now. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Bob. There we go. Okay. Um, yeah, so, and, and as I was saying, that kind of leaves out the, the Dodge Caravans and Ford Tauruses of the world, uh, which where they're a little more pedestrian and you saw them all the time. Um, you know, you take a snapshot of cars that were on the road at any given time, and there's a lot of Ford Tauruses and Dodge Caravans on the road. Um, so they're, they're really pretty important and things that don't get collected in these other more exotic uh, car collections that I mentioned before. Um, so it's, it's pretty diversified and it's a pretty good mature collection, at least in, in my opinion, but I'll take you through um, some of what we have here. Uh, and I guess with all of that, uh, we'll get started. So there's, of course, the Detroit Historical Museum. We're at 5401 Woodward in Midtown. Uh, kind of sandwiched between Wayne State, uh, the Public Library, and the Detroit Institute of Art. Of course, we also operate the Dawson Great Lakes Museum um, out on Belle Isle. So I'm going to start off by talking about um, some of the some of the unusual or strange cars in our collection. Uh, a lot of these are one-off, but some were pretty limited production. Um, We'll get started here with uh, this category we call altogether unusual. Um, and out of the unusual cars in our collection, this is probably the most unusual. It is a 1913 Scripps Booth Super Sport by Autogo, uh, which is a really long name with two hyphens. And had they workshopped that a little better, I think they could have narrowed it down a little more. But uh, this was recently in an exhibit at the uh, famous Peterson Museum in California called, quote, What Were They Thinking? unquote. And by looking at the automobile, you, you might be asking yourself that question. So James, James Scripps Booth was the son of George Booth, 
who, uh, if that name sounds familiar, he was the guy who essentially made the Detroit News a successful newspaper. And James Scripps Booth was the son of James Scripps, who founded the Detroit News and uh, went on to start the Detroit Times and was the name and family behind kind of the Scripps uh, media empire that still exists today. But he used this family money uh, essentially to get into the cycle car business. Uh, Scripps Booth is founded in 1913. It's eventually acquired by GM in 1916 uh, before it was discontinued in 1923. Uh, out of our car collection, I'm, I'm actually really proud to say we have six cars in our collection that appear on this Time Magazine's 50 Worst Cars of All Time list. Uh, and as we get to them through the presentation, I'll call them out. But the Biotigo uh, was, in Time Magazine's opinion, the fifth worst car of all time. Um, essentially, it's, uh, I'll read you the, the list from that, or I'll read you the entry from that Time Magazine's worst list. And it walks you through a lot of the features and kind of the interesting uh, aspects of this car, quote unquote, if you can even call it that. So Time Magazine said, the Biotigo is a 3,200-pound motorcycle with training wheels, a V8 engine, and enough copper tubing to provide every hillbilly in the Ozarks with a still. The Scripps Booth Biotigo was the daft experiment of James Scripps Booth, an heir to the Scripps publishing fortune and self-taught or untaught auto engineer. The Biotigo was essentially a two-wheeled vehicle carrying its considerable heft, its considerable heft on 37-inch wooden wheels. At slow speeds, the driver could lower the small wheels on, the, on outriggers to stabilize the vehicle so it wouldn't plop over. This is not a case of advantage of hindsight. This was obviously a crazy idea, even in 1913. The Biotigo does enjoy the historical distinction of being the first V8-powered vehicle ever built in Detroit, so it could argue that it's the beginning of an even greater folly." End quote. So, ouch. Uh, Time Magazine did not like the Supersport by Autigo. Um, but it's really interesting to see this uh, vehicle in the context of um, the time. Uh, you know, 1913 obviously is still pretty early in uh, the development of the automobile and the kind of idea of the automobile is still really malleable at this point. And it's, it's fluid enough where... Um, this kind of crazy idea at a halfway point between a car and a motorcycle, this strange three seat uh, arrangement that you get a little bit of a picture of there in the black and white inset um, is, uh, you know, kind of fertile ground for something crazy like this to be um, invented essentially or come up with or refined. Um, the cycle car certainly an idea. A lot of people had been building cycle cars particularly in the teens. There was 25 companies in Detroit alone in the 19 teens building cycle cars. Um, but uh, it's interesting that the, just the, at this point in time in history, the idea of the car is, is so kind of fluid and up in the air. Um, this recently, this picture, the big one on the slide here is an older picture of the car and it recently went, underwent a complete um, cosmetic restoration you can see a picture of it here when it was on display in our automotive show place at the Detroit Historical Museum. Um, the uh, Detroit uh, Mob Steel Company in Detroit, uh, who has the show uh, Detroit Steel, actually went through and, and did all the work on the, on the vehicle and it looks great, especially for 107 years old. But as a bit of a peek behind the scenes, this thing is almost impossible to move. Uh, it's not in running condition, but it has a special moving cradle um, that has to be attached to it to be able to move it. Uh, it's too heavy, you know, simply for people to hold up on either side without being crushed. Um, so it's, it's an interesting car to move. It's an interesting car to display, and it's kind of interesting all across the board. Um, James Scripps Booth uh, is one of these people that you see throughout automotive history where he's just one of these guys who's obsessed with the mechanism of what makes a car work um, and tinkering. He actually gets his start with automobiles, um, you know, working on his uh, wealthy family's cars. The Scripps family was an early adopter of automobiles, and James Scripps Booth was fascinated by cars from the get-go, uh, and he was constantly pulling them apart, putting them back together, 
uh, so much that he was his family's kind of designated mechanic whenever they would go on road trips. So he would fix the car and he would drive them around at the same time. The car itself is pretty interesting, but um, one of the highlights of the acquisition back in the 50s was that we also received a handful of these mechanical drawings um, straight from the pen of the man, James Scripps Booth, who designed the car. Um, so again, really early in automotive history, it's interesting to be able to look at these and kind of work through some of the aesthetic and design issues that a young car guy at the time was working through. Uh, he would go on to make more cycle cars. Uh, we have a handful in the collection, five in the collection. This is one of them. Um, this one's more practical, and I use practical kind of in a quote-unquote sense, more practical than the biodigal, but still kind of one of these supercharged go-karts that were available to the rich um, at the time. This is a 1914 JB Rocket cycle car. Um, and it was billed as being able to reach 80 miles an hour, which is actually terrifying to think about going 80 miles an hour in this car. But it cost $385 new, which is only $140 roughly less than a regular full-size car. Um, so the, the market for the cycle car was really a niche market. It was somebody who probably already had a car and already had a motorcycle and was trying out something different. It wasn't, uh, you know, somebody getting into the market for their first vehicle was buying a cycle car. Um, so obviously it didn't last long, but they're this interesting stopping point uh, along the way of automotive history. The next one I'm going to talk about is probably pretty recognizable to people. This is a 1935 Stout Scarab. It's actually number six out of about 10 that were built. Um, it gets its name really from its, uh, the Scarab Beetle and really this beetle-like appearance. This thing's been called the first minivan. Uh, you know, it's been called a, a VW Bug, um, you know, ancestor. It's been called all sorts of things, but it has a lot of really, really unique characteristics that, you know, I find fascinating. This might be my favorite vehicle in the collection. You might hear me say that a couple times throughout the presentation. Um, so out of the unique characteristics, probably the most unique is that it's a rear-mounted Ford V8 engine. Um, it's unibody construction. Its passenger cabin essentially sat down inside the suspension as opposed to sitting on top of the suspension. And so Stout in his autobiography said that as he was driving this car around the country promoting it and his work, he kept a glass of water on the dashboard and drove all the way from Detroit to Los Angeles without spilling the glass of water that was on his dashboard. Uh, it has an aluminum exoskeleton and in the next slide or, or two slides I'll show you uh, kind of the, the construction of this exoskeleton which is really pretty interesting. Uh, it has a floating seating arrangement which the driver's seat was the only one fastened down to the floor of the vehicle. Every other seat in the car could be moved around into different configurations. And uh, it had a table that could fold down from the edge. It was really designed with uh, passenger comfort kind of at the fore. And then everything else was worked around with that. Even the, the innovation of moving the engine to the back of the car was done with the idea that it would open up the passenger cabin and be, let people move around a little more freely as the car was moving. Um, so here we'll go on to the next slide. You can see the back end of it here and you really get that, uh, you know, beetle uh, and scarab beetle in particular uh, picture from there. Um, one of the neat things about this car that you don't really notice when it's on display is that um, the engine access panel uh, is so well integrated, you might not even notice where it is. I grabbed this picture uh, just off the internet of another scarab at a car show, and you can see the like beetle wings essentially on the back that open up to allow you to access the the engine in the back there. Uh, it's really it's really a pretty neat thing to see in person. On the next slide here, you can see the exoskeleton I was talking about. So it had kind of a tubular framing. Um, really kind of aircraft inspired framing and then the uh, aluminum was put on top of the skeleton. You can also see in this picture in the upper left hand corner the suspension uh, and how high up the suspension was in relation to the passenger cabin. So uh, again like I talked about it was 
an extremely comfortable ride sitting down inside the suspension as opposed to rolling on top of the suspension with every twist and turn. This car actually belonged to Chicago's Wrigley family. Uh, so Wrigley Gum, the Chicago Cubs, uh, the Wrigley Building, Wrigley Field, uh, they used it essentially as a car to get from their beach house up on Lake Michigan to the beach and back to the house to the beach and back to the house, which is a pretty good gig uh, if you can get it. Our next slide here is a picture of Bill Stout with a 1946 Scarab uh, with a fiberglass body. So he never really stopped tinkering around with things. Uh, this is 11 years after the Scarab and what he did was he kept one 1935 Scarab, pulled the aluminum body off of it and created a fiberglass body to go on top of it. You can see the back end of it here in this next picture um, on, on display and on loan to the Gilmore Museum in Kalamazoo. Um, and it uh, is a little more conventional on the back end. If you, you know, just looked quickly, um, that could pass for, you know, a fastback Buick, uh, possibly of the time. Uh, a little more conventional on the back end, but of course the fiberglass was revolutionary so much that um, uh, I, I misspoke in saying it was on loan to the Gilmore Museum. It's actually done at the National Corvette Museum currently um, as the Corvette kind of credits Stout and the Scarab and the fiberglass body is one of the forerunners uh, of that technology. Like the Scripps Booth donation, we got a lot of Bill Stout's kind of conceptual drawings. Um, which is, is fascinating. Here you can see a side profile view and cutaway view of the 46 uh, scarab up on top there and then the 35 down below. You can see the floating seating arrangement there. The seat in the back on the bottom drawing that the two ladies are sitting on is actually the rear seat that's pushed right up against the engine compartment. But you can see they pulled it out and turned it to uh, facilitate a little bit better conversation. Uh, Stout is really, ahead of his time in a lot of different ways um, and a true outside the box thinker. Uh, we're gonna quickly go through some of his other non-automobile related work just because it's so interesting. Um, so we'll start out with, a, with his uh, Scarab bus, um, which was made on a limited scale by actually Gar Wood um, and was uh, bought by the Dearborn Coach Company and ran around in Dearborn a little bit. This really uh, 46, the later Scarab edition looking bus, but it has a lot of the same, um, a lot of the same innovations that the 35 Scarab had with the uh, unibody construction, the suspension, the exoskeleton and frame, that sort of thing. He was also really interested in mobility, um, kind of broadly in mobility. So this is a conceptual drawing for what he called a rail bus. And this was essentially a bus that could uh, drive on the street, just like any regular bus, but then also uh, connect to the railroad infrastructure, put down rail wheels. Um, then when it was done on the track, pull up those wheels, deploy the bus wheels and drive away on city streets. He got his start in uh, aircraft uh, design and aircraft engineering. Um, and he's probably most famous for developing the Ford tri-motor, uh, that engine and that plane. You can see him in the upper left-hand corner there as an older man standing in front of a Ford tri-motor plane. Um, he actually started the first commercial airline in Michigan um, and was the oldest passenger service airline in operation in the country in the 30s. Um, you can see it flew all over the Great Lakes from you know, Chicago to Detroit, to Cleveland to Grand Rapids uh, and all over, but it operated out of uh, Dearborn's Ford Airport. His, uh, you know, outside the box thinking, like I mentioned, wasn't limited to automobiles or rail cars or buses. He was really interested in personal aviation. The picture in the upper right corner is, sorry, the upper left-hand corner is a, a wooden model in our collection also of the Stout Skycar. Um, and this was essentially the Model T uh, for airplanes. This was an airplane he envisioned that every person in the country would own. And the wings uh, would you know, fold out obviously to, to allow for flight, but then they would fold in on top of each other uh, so you can put it in your own personal hangar once you got it home. 
Uh, it drove like a car. You can see it has four wheels. It would drive to the airport, take off, and then uh, you could drive it right home after that. In the bottom right hand corner is another conceptual drawing for what was essentially a semi trailer that could be affixed to an airplane. Um, so it could be towed to the airport, a plane could uh, taxi up, pick up the cargo, fly it wherever it needed to go, get to the airport, drop it off, and then it could be towed away again. The next one we have from him here is uh, what are called his bat wing planes uh, for obvious reasons, it's kind of these delta wing uh, planes that he was really interested in developing. The bottom right hand corner is another model from our collection um, and the upper left hand corner there is a full size model that was actually built and test flown out of Ford Airport in Dearborn. Um, it looks like metal on the wings, but it's actually plywood. Uh, we're fortunate enough to also have a piece of plywood in our, <laughs> in our collection from this plane. Um, it's, you know, obviously it looks like one of the stealth bombers and um, it's probably not uh, too distant an ancestor from that. But with that, we'll get back into the car collection. Um, so we have a handful of prototypes, so aside from these really limited production cars that we were talking about earlier. This is a 1963 Ford Cougar II and was essentially handmade. It started out its life as a Shelby Cobra um, and was stripped down and the platform was used as a styling exercise by Ford engineers. It was spec'd out to have a 260 cubic inch V8 and was supposedly and reportedly by uh, Ford capable of speeds of up to 170 miles an hour. Uh, the design featured an integrated roll bar. It was fully instrumentated. Um, they had pop-up headlights in the front. It had wire wheels. You can see the interior there. Um, and because it had required a special piece of glass on the back there, um, you know, there's a lot of 63 Corvette in there. And it was really kind of Ford's answer to the 63 Corvette, even though it didn't really get off the ground. Uh, but you can see that huge piece of glass on the back. The engineers were actually worried that this big piece of glass would pop right out of the back if you were driving uh, fast with the windows down. So they built in this pressure release panel, which the red arrow indicates there, that would pop up and essentially let air out the back of the car if the windows were open and going quickly. It currently doesn't have an engine. It came to the museum without an engine, so it's a rolling chassis. This is the sister car to that 63 Cougar II. It's called, you know, broadly the Bourdonnais Cobra, uh, as it was designed by Eugene Bourdonnais. You can see a lot of the, the coupe um, that we just talked about in this car as well. This one's in completely original condition, uh, again, without an engine, uh, as it came to the museum that way. This one might be our most uh, famous prototype as it got out quite a bit uh, during the 50th anniversary of the Mustang a couple years ago. So famously, the first year of Mustang production is 1964 and a half. Uh, and obviously this is different, it's a 1963, so what gives? Well, the, the story of this car actually begins a year earlier with this vehicle that is not in our collection. Uh, it's the 1962 Ford Mustang Experimental Sports Car, which actually belongs to the Henry Ford. Um, which was a concept car essentially designed to generate interest in Ford and never to go into production. But it generated so much interest that when Ford was naming their new sports car for 1964, the Mustang, uh, some within the company were worried that the buyers would be disappointed because the production model wasn't going to look anything like this experimental sports car. So this is where our Mustang II comes in. It kept some elements from the experimental sports car, the blue and white paint scheme, uh, the removable hardtop, uh, the two by two seating, two seats in the front, two seats in the back, uh, divided by a transmission hump. And then uh, that design element was mirrored in the back seat. Um, but it also added uh, elements borrowed from the production car. So the running horse decal, Actually, the first time the Mustang running horse decal appears on a car is on this 1963 Mustang II. Uh, the C-shaped side cutouts that are featured pretty prominently in the photo on the upper, uh, in the upper part of the slide there. And then the 289 engine uh, that would be in the production car was also put into this experimental sports car. So this car, as, as interesting as it is, is kind of a story of managing people's expectations 
uh, which is funny to think about. Our next one here is, uh, it's kind of half prototype, half production. Um, the 63 Chrysler turbine. Um, since World War II, Chrysler had been working on gas turbine engines. Um, they had received a government contract to, to create one during the war. And ever since, they were trying to apply this research into making it power an automobile. Uh, the closest they ever came was this example here, um, the turbine developed by Chrysler and then bodied by Ghia uh, out of Italy. The, uh, to test the practicality of the car, Chrysler launched uh, really this extensive test, test drive program to gauge how the car performed under real world conditions. So they built 50 turbines and distributed them to 203 drivers across 133 cities and 48 states, including two from Detroit who test drove the car for three months and clocked over a million miles total. Overall, the test drivers loved it. Their only consistent complaint was finding the recommended unleaded gas or diesel to put into the tank. Um, the turbine engine has a lot of advantages over a traditional uh, internal combustion engine. Uh, it requires 80% fewer parts than a piston-driven engine. Uh, they also last longer. They eliminate the need for tune-ups, oil changes. They don't require a complicated cooling system uh, because, and, uh, because the engine could run on anything combustible. Um, it could be powered by gas or diesel, like I mentioned before, kerosene. And even in two demonstrations, they powered it with peanut oil, tequila, and Chanel Number no. 5, um, which is a little more expensive than your, you know, your unleaded gasoline. But um, it could if you wanted it to. It could run on Chanel Number no. 5. So we get a lot of questions about where we keep all of these cars. Um, we don't keep them on site at the Detroit Historical Museum and um, some quick Googling about uh, Detroit's bubble cars will bring you to a lot of pictures from our collection storage warehouse, which I always joke is at an undisclosed location in Southwest Detroit. Um, but here's some pictures of the interior of our car storage facility um, and our, our famous bubbles. The, the bubbles came about as really a, a pretty, uh, a, <laughs> forgive the term again, outside the box way to store cars in our building. Uh, they keep dust off the cars, they keep water off the cars should uh, there be any roof leaks. Um, they pull in air from the outside and circulate around so it creates kind of a micro environment with a moving air current that helps prevent mold, uh, which might be a problem in a big unconditioned space like we have. Um, so we, anytime I go out and talk about our cars, I always get questions about the bubble cars. So I thought I would uh, just point them out here. We also have a really good collection of really early automobiles and uh, orphan brands specific to Detroit. This one, and we're going to uh, go a little faster here just so we can try to get through as many cars as possible uh, before our time's up. But um, this one is an 1896 King. It was created by Charles Brady King and was essentially the first car to drive on the streets of Detroit. Um, he helped, this is actually a reproduction which he supervised the construction of um, for a, a parade in uh, 1951, uh, the 250th um, birthday of Detroit. Uh, there was a big parade in downtown Detroit and Charles Brady King sat and uh, was at the tiller for the parade. And then they ran it again a couple years later uh, during the 60th anniversary of the automobile um, in Detroit as well. Um, but it's uh, mostly reproduction, but built with some period pieces. Next one here is our 1905 Cadillac Osceola. Um, it belonged to Cadillac founder Henry Leland and was the first Cadillac with an enclosed body. Uh, it's a really early on Fisher body construction. Um, and really, you know, by the look of it, it's a true horseless carriage. I mean, it's a, essentially a carriage body just uh, schlepped right onto an automotive chassis. Um, it's, a, it's a fascinating car. It's really something to behold in person and should be on display at the museum uh, uh, fairly soon. It's much, much taller than you would anticipate it being. Next one here is a 1909 to 1911. Uh, it's the same model, essentially all those years, brush runabout. Uh, this one is currently out on loan as well, but this car is in operating condition. It's a one-cylinder engine. It ha actually has a wooden axle and frame. 
uh, and you can see the coil springs there. This next one is a 1911 Model T, and if you have a Model T in your collection, you better have a good story to go with it. Um, you know, they built millions of them, literally, so uh, I better have a good story. This one, uh, so the story goes, was actually uh, the original owner wanted to give it to his son-in-law, who was going to strip it down and part it out. The original owner said, I'm not going to do that. I'd rather bury it in my backyard than give it to you. So that's essentially what he did. Uh, at the time, it was some farmland up on the northwest side of Detroit, and he buried the car, and um, it kind of became this local Detroit urban legend that there was a Model T buried up off of Seven Mile Road. So um, in the 1960s, Bud Guest on WJR got a hold of this story and started taking calls and trying to really hunt this thing down and see if they could dig it up. So it got some momentum behind it. Ford got involved. They located this car um, out in what was now a subdivision off of Seven Mile Road and uh, dug it up. And we have some pictures of the excavation of the car. And here is one in the lower right hand corner there of what it looked like uh, on display at the museum after it came out of the ground. And you can see there really wasn't much left. Um, the Henry Ford is a great exhibit. Uh, obviously about the Model T and how much wood was in it while well, you bury, you know, a wooden car, mostly wooden car for uh, 50 years and eventually most of it's gonna rot away. You can see the steering column's still there, a lot of the engine's still there, uh, but most of the wood was pretty far gone. It actually had to be suspended from the ceiling. You can see some of the wires in the photo um, and it would have been great to keep it that way, but it's really kind of hard to display. So Ford Motor came in and gave the car a complete restoration which you kind of lose a lot of the story of the car, um, but it's a lot easier to display. And I guess he used the photos to tell the story. We also have uh, the sporty red two-seater in 1924 Hup, uh, which was restored in 1955. We have a 1918 Maxwell touring car, which of course Maxwell was the, uh, the brand that became Chrysler in 1926. We also have a 1924 Rickenbacker, um, and of course, famously, the Rickenbacker logo that's featured in the upper right-hand corner there was the uh, World War I uh, squadron logo for Eddie Rickenbacker. Um, you know, cars have a, have a great tradition of using famous people's names to try to buy some legitimacy and some prestige, you know, Chevrolet probably being the chief example of that. Uh, but Rickenb Rickenbacker, made in Detroit, gave it a go and failed after six or seven years. Uh, it's in original condition, uh, but this one is actually out on loan to the Gilmore Museum as well. Uh, with that, I think we've gotten to uh, kind of the end of our time and maybe even a little more. Uh, there's a lot more to this presentation that, um, you know, the Detroit Historical Society, of course, has a speakers bureau as well, and we go out and get this uh, the full presentation, you can see a little bit more and get that plug out of the way. Um, so if that's of any interest, of course, let us know. But um, yeah, I'm happy to, happy to answer any questions anybody might have and I'll uh, take the presentation down and you can see my face. All right, we, are, we do have a few questions that uh, did come in. Um, um, a few are, are big, big picture questions. Uh, and I noticed that uh, if she's still on the call, I noticed your uh, director of the Historical Society is, uh, has joined us today. Um, oh, great. First question that I saw from John Mills was about any consideration for ever driving any of your vehicles in the Thanksgiving parade to generate more interest in the museum. Yeah, um, you know, that's something we, we talk about from time to time. Yeah, it's always, you know, kind of this interesting balance between um, use and preservation. You know, we're, we're not essentially in the business of driving cars and because they're um, part of uh, the collection, the collection is beholden to a lot of um, museum uh, collection ethical standards, I guess. Um, and so in the same way we wouldn't uh, fire off our Civil War rifles or wear our historic clothing. You know, technically we don't drive our cars either. Um, the Mustang that I mentioned before was made operable just because it had so many public engagements um, during that 50th anniversary year for the Mustang that it was just a heck of a lot easier and a lot safer to drive the car on and off trailers and around showgrounds than having people push them and tow it and that sort of thing. 
Um, so yeah, it would really depend on the car and really if, um, you know, without getting into too much detail, if it was something that was donated to the museum specifically for that reason to be driven, um, then that's kind of the workaround uh, from, you know, really keeping the preservation chief, uh, chief among uh, our concerns. But yeah, right. it's been talked about, I guess. Okay. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, another question. This is not car related, but uh, talking about the Ulysses and Julia Grant house that was up at the state fairgrounds, um, is the Historical Society possibly interested in operating it as a museum once it's moved to the Eastern Market area? And I don't know oh, if you that's, know, that's a, a Jeremy question or, or an Alana question. Yeah, you know, essentially the um, um, State Historic Museum, the Michigan History Center, uh, has uh, uh, been involved in that. And they're, you know, really the, the driving force uh, behind the move back to Eastern Market and that. Uh, we have a handful of uh, artifacts out of the house. We have the bed that Grant slept in, uh, a few other of his furnishings just in the general museum collection. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the State History Center, unless I'm mistaken, uh, really has the, uh, they're, uh, they're the ones involved uh, and most involved with that. Okay. Um, Steve Purdy, our speaker from a couple of weeks ago, had a question. Is there an inventory list for the collection and are there opportunities for people to see those storied cars? Yeah, uh, there is an inventory list and a lot of them are photographed and available through our online collection website. Um, we've digitized a good chunk of our collection that is available through DetroitHistorical.org slash collections. And then you can go in and search Mustang II, you can search Osceola and see a lot more photos than I was able to show today. Um, so all of those that have been photographed are available up online that you can see, you know, from your house this afternoon. We also occasionally offer behind the scenes tours at our Collections Resource Center uh, that I mentioned uh, at the undisclosed location in Southwest Detroit. But um, yeah, uh, occasionally. Um, the Historical Society has a pretty robust behind the scenes tour program um, and our collections warehouse is, is featured among those tours every now and then. So yeah, you can come and get a tour of the place and I'll walk you around and show you everything. Highly, highly recommended. Also, uh, we have a question from Marsha Harris. Um, how does one find the value of uh, an old or antique car? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And it kind of boils down to, you know, what you're, what you're looking to get out of it. You know, if it's kind of resale value, that's one thing. Insurance value is obviously another thing. Um, and then the historical value, which is, you know, kind of priceless. Um, the, the, um, you know, uh, talk a lot about blue book value or even, you know, roughly for uh, historical items, you know, a pretty good indication of what something is going for is an eBay listing or even a local antique shop. Um, you know, if you, you look around and, and see enough bond ads for your particular uh, make and model of car, you get a pretty good idea of what they're going for and what they're worth and kind of what the range is. Uh, of course, you always get one in there that, you know, somebody's trying to sell it for $100,000, which throws the curve way off. But um, yeah, generally just looking around at the, at what others are going for with similar options and similar restoration level, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, a couple uh, more general questions that have come in. Uh, one from Jonathan uh, talking about uh, how has the current pandemic impacted any future planning or outreach for the historical society? And um, what is the future of uh, the collection on digital platforms. Yeah, um, so I mentioned before, I guess I'll tackle that. Uh, well, let me, I'll, I'll back up and start from the beginning, I guess. Um, so yeah, the museum's been closed uh, since late March, like a, a lot of other businesses and historical institutions. You know, we're anxious to get back up and operating like everybody else. Um, but a lot of that work is being done as a cultural center, uh, jointly between the museum, uh, the Scarab Club, the DIA, and kind of all the cultural partners there in the cultural center. Um, so, you know, as soon as uh, things start opening up and it's safe to do so, 
and we're looking at a bunch of different ways to continue uh, all the things we do just in a different way. Um, the future for the uh, collection and kind of digital medium is really exciting. Um, we've uh, been really active and been a leader in getting our collection up and available online. And a lot of other historical institutions as scanning technology um, improves have been doing that as well. The, the problem is it just, um, you know, you get a scanner, it's kind of limited to two dimensional material. And how do you, how do you make digital three dimensional material? Uh, the National Park Service has uh, a specifically a three dimensional car scanning machine um, that they set it up. It takes laser readings all around the car and they can build kind of a three dimensional profile of of a vehicle and they've been doing that for all of the cars on the Historic Vehicles Association um, uh, um, registry, um, which is essentially a, a, like the National uh, Historic Registry, but for automobiles as opposed to buildings or historic sites. So, um, I mean, that's one that's pretty far out there and really expensive still. Um, the two-dimensional stuff is easy where we're running into problems is the three-dimensional material because at least right now the most affordable thing is to take pictures uh, of things from as many angles as you can and put them up and let people try and find their way around. But there's um, you know more scanning technology that's becoming three-dimensional scanning uh, technology that's becoming more and more affordable. Um, it's just kind of far out there for now. We uh, had a meeting a couple months ago with uh, this firm that uh, lives in augmented reality. Uh, that's really their thing. And think about augmented reality with historic resources is pretty exciting. For example, we have um, a, the clock that actually drove the, uh, the clock mechanism that drove the four-sided clock that was in the cupola of old Detroit City Hall. Um, and they were talking about with augmented reality, being able to make that clock move and be able to see all the intricate clock movement of that uh, digitally. So when you start thinking about stuff like that, it's, it's really exciting or taking your phone out on Belle Isle and, you know, looking at a, a view of what Belle Isle used to look like in that particular area of Belle Isle is, is pretty darn exciting uh, and cool immersive technology. So it's all out there kind of on the forefront. It's just a, um, for, a, for a lot of reasons, it's cost prohibitive at this point. Okay, and the final question that, uh, that I see here is, uh, this is an easy one, Jeremy. Uh, what's the best way to contact you through the museum? Yeah, um, so I'm, um, all my contact information is on the museum's webpage, um, but I'll, uh, my email is probably the best way to get me now as we've been working uh, from home for a while. So uh, my email is my first name, Jeremy, uh, and then D, uh, Jeremy D at DetroitHistorical.org. Um, and if you just search my name, Jeremy Dimmick, uh, Detroit Historical in Google, usually you can find it pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, Jeremy D at DetroitHistorical.org. Excellent. And if you are watching the chat section, um, Brian, my colleague, has put up the link for the Detroit Historical Society's collection on Past Perfect, uh, which is available through the DetroitHistorical.org website. Uh, so if you want to search their collection, uh, how many uh, items do you have now digitized uh, on the collection, Jeremy? Yeah, it's right up around 80,000. Um, and so awesome. we're, we're making, yeah, we're making pretty good progress. Okay. Um, so we're just about ready to wrap up. We have uh, just a couple minutes left. And so I'd like, if, if Brian can get my uh, final slide up, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for attending another great program. Thank you, Jeremy, for your wonderful presentation on the cool cars from the Detroit Historical Society collection. Uh, we have another great presentation coming up next week on Friday, June the 5th. Uh, it'll be the fourth in our Motor Cities at Home series. And since the stay at home order is still in effect, we're thinking that a lot of you are still gonna be uh, here and available to join us next week. Uh, that presentation is going to feature uh, Michael Rodriguez from Lansing, 
and he is going to be sharing, this is gonna be a different from any of our previous three presentations. Uh, he's actually gonna be sharing his documentary film, which is called R.E. Olds and the First Auto City. And that is going to get underway at noon, 12 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time, next Friday, June the 5th. And we're going to be talking about Lansing next week. So hopefully uh, many of you will be able to join us then. And uh, one last thing, again, if you've enjoyed what you've seen today, uh, please explore MotorCities.org, our website. Learn more about what Motor Cities National Heritage is and what we do on a daily basis to keep the history of our automotive and labor heritage alive. Feel free to uh, become a member, support us if, if, you, if you've liked what you've heard, and we look forward to seeing you again next Friday, June the 5th. Thanks a lot, everybody.